Last week, we finished up our series on waiting, dating, and mating. Hopefully, you got some good stuff out of that. Tonight, we're going to begin a new series called The Basics. The Basics. Um, we're going to talk about the basics of Christianity uh, or Christian life over the next few weeks and what that looks like. Um, when we were at the winter retreat and I taught you guys how to study the Bible and you're like, hey, this is my favorite thing, it was kind of a reminder of, you know, a lot of times we take for granted um, what you guys should know if you've grown up in church, you know, because I would assume at the winter retreat that you all knew how to study the Bible. So it was a learning thing for me as well as you. So with that, I decided we're going to spend the next few weeks talking about some of the, the Christian life principles or some of the things um, that, that Christian life is about. Things like scripture, things like prayer, things like worship, things like belonging to church, things like tithing, things like baptism. These are all things that if you belong, to, if you're a Christian, that at some point in your life, this, these things are going to happen. You're going to encounter them. You're going you're gonna to live them out, whatever. They're all different basic things that we should put into our life uh, if we're a Christian. Um, because it's almost impossible to grow closer to God if we don't understand the basics. Much like building a house is impossible if you don't first lay a foundation. And so tonight, we're going to get started with talking about um, probably the first and most important thing is the Bible. The B-I-B-L-E. You guys know that song? The B-I-B-L-E. Yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God. The B-I-B-L-E. How many of you guys know that song? How many of y'all don't know that song? That's okay. The only reason we know it is because we grew up in church. Um, so tonight we're going to talk about the Bible. Uh, we're going to answer questions like where it came from, why we should believe it, and uh, at the end I'll talk again about how to study it in case you weren't at the winter retreat. Um, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete equipped for every good work. The message version puts it like this. Every part of scripture is God-breathed and useful for one way or another, showing us truth, exposing our rebellion, correcting our mistakes, training us to live God's way. Through the word, we are put together and shaped up for the task that God has for us. The Bible is a book that is not merely meant for reading. It is a book that is meant for studying. It's meant to spend time in so that we can find things to apply to our life. The Bible, uh, you can also be referred to as God's Word, uh, Scripture. Um, the Scriptures, or God's Word, is as binding as the laws of nature. We can ignore the Bible, but we do so to our own detriment. Just like if we ignore the law of gravity, right? If I jump off, you know, kind of like Benny jumping off that U-Haul, right? He decided I'm going to ignore the law of gravity, uh, and he figured out, you know, you're going to fall, and you're going to potentially get hurt. Luckily, he didn't get hurt. Um, but it's kind of like that. Like the Bible is a binding law that we can choose to spend time in or not. Either way, it's going to affect us. Studying the Bible can be compared to mining for gold, if we make a little effort and we only sift through the pebbles in a stream, we're only going to find small flakes of gold. But when you dig down deep and you go beneath the surface and you get into it, the reward you're going to gain for your effort is going to be greater. And so the first question I want to answer uh, is where did the Bible come from? Where did the Bible come from? How many of you guys know this? Some of you have probably grown up in your church and you just well know it's the Bible. You know, it, it came from somewhere. somewhere. Um, the word Bible actually is, uh, comes from Latin and Greek words meaning book. Uh, it's a fitting name since the Bible is the book for all people and all of time. There are about 40 different authors contributed to the Bible, which was written over a period of about 1,500 years. The authors of the Bible were kings, fishermen, priests, government officials, farmers, shepherds, and doctors. From all this diversity comes an incredible unity with common themes woven throughout. The Bible's unity is due to the fact that ultimately it has one author, God himself. 
The Bible is God-breathed, as 2 Timothy said. The human authors wrote exactly what God wanted them to write, and the result was the perfect and holy word of God. 2 Peter 1.21 says, Prophecy of Scripture never had its origin in the human will, but prophets, though human, spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. The best way to grasp what Peter is talking about being carried along, that's how the authors, the 40 authors of the Bible, humans, where they were carried along by the Spirit. I forget the theological term for that. Y'all don't care anyways because you're not a Bible major in college. Um, but the, the idea is that the Holy Spirit carried these men along. It's kind of like this. In Acts 27, Paul was under arrest and he was being taken to Rome. And Luke describes the journey a wind of hurricane force called the Northeastern swept down. The ship was caught in the storm, and it could not head into the wind. So, he, we, so we gave way to it and were driven along. The word Luke uses here for the ship being driven along by the wind is the same word that Peter uses for the prophets being carried along by the Spirit. And so how much control do you have when your ship is being carried along by a storm? The direction of the boat was controlled by the wind in the same way that the message of the prophets who wrote the scripture was controlled by the Spirit. These men did not control the message. The message controlled them. It came to them from God like a mighty wind. You've probably heard, uh, if you've been around church long enough or studied Christianity at all, you've probably heard of other books outside of what we know as the Old Testament, New Testament Bible, the Bible that you and I hold uh, and have access to. You've probably heard that there's other books out there, right? How many of you guys have heard that? Um, but in AD 363, the Council of La Laodicea stated that, they, the, that only the Old Testament along with the book of the Apocrypha and 26 books of the New Testament, everything but Revelation, were canonical. Canonical, canonical means we're going to put, this is what we're saying, these, these uh, books of the Bible are what's important. These were the things that they were put into our Bible. And then in 393 AD, the Council of Hippo, and then in 397, the Council of Carthage also affirm the same 27 books as authoritative. And so something important to remember about these councils. So these were just a couple hundred years after Jesus, right? And so these councils met together, you know, because there was all these other writings that they were finding at this time. And so they got together and they said, well, you know, we need to establish what books are going to fall in the canon of Scripture. What books, what letters are going to be part of what we know as the Bible. And the council followed some principles to determine whether uh, a New Testament book was truly inspired by the whole. The Old Testament, they were like, we know that. That's kind of, it's, it's Jewish custom. It's been that way all along. They left the Old Testament kind of alone, but the New Testament is the one they had to decide which books are going to be the ones that are important and that we're going to put as the Bible, right? Um, and so the first principle was that the author was an apostle or have a close connection with an apostle. So the author of a New Testament book, in order for it to be canon, it had to be written by an apostle, meaning somebody who was there with Jesus, or somebody who was really close and connected with that apostle. For example, um, forget, one of the gospels, I, I want to say it's Matthew or Mark, didn't, they didn't actually they didn't write it because they were there. They wrote it because Peter told them the story, and that's how Mark or Matt, I don't remember which Mark or Matthew, but anyways. And so in order for a book to be in the New Testament, it had to be, first, it had to be uh, an author of an apostle or a close connection. Secondly, uh, the book had to be accepted by the body of Christ at large. So the Christians that existed during this time, had to, they had to accept this book. They had to agree that it was right. Um, and the third one is, did the book contain consistency of doctrine and orthodox teaching? Meaning, was it important? Did it hold uh, what we would call theological meat? And the last principle was, did the book bear evidence of high moral and spiritual values that would reflect a work of the Holy Spirit? And so these councils during this time, right after Jesus, right, deciding which New Testament books and letters will be included in the New Testament, um, they use these principles to help determine, but it's important for us to remember that even though the council made some decisions, 
they did not determine the books of the Bible. It was ultimately God who determined the books of the Bible. No early church council decided on the canon. It was God and God alone who determined which books belonged in the Bible. Because we know that God works out everything for, uh, for our good and his glory, and we know that he is fully in control. That means that the decisions that the councils made at this time as well were carried along by the Spirit. And so we can trust that the books uh, that are in our Bible are what we need to know in order to gain more understanding of who Jesus is, who God is, and what it, li- what it means to live as a Christian. Second thing I want to talk about is why should we believe? Why should I believe the Bible? Why should I believe it? What is it that makes it b- believable? Um, the internal evidence of Scripture's legitimacy provides many compelling arguments for why one should believe the Bible. The first one is the unique message of the Bible sets it apart from other religious texts. The Bible, for instance, teaches that mankind is inerrantly evil and deserving of eternal death. If man were responsible for the content of the Bible, the view of humanity would not be so dark. We tend to make ourselves look good. The Bible also teaches that humans can do nothing of themselves to remedy their natural state. This too goes against human pride. You see, other religious texts put men, men and mankind at the center, and it, and it makes them seem like they can attain some type of glory, or they can attain some type of thing. The Bible is the only religious text that sets mankind apart, saying we are inherently evil and not in a good state. The second one is the unity of the biblical message. It's, it's further reason why one should believe the Bible. The Bible, like I said, was written over 1,500 years. Over 1,500 years was the process of of writing the Bible. The Bible was written by 40 human authors, most of whom did not know each other and were from varying backgrounds. The Bible was written in various environments, desert, prison, royal court. It was written in three different languages— And despite covering controversial topics, it carries one harmonious message. The circumstances surrounding the writing of the Bible would seem to guarantee its unreliability. And yet the message from Genesis to Revelation is entirely consistent. And so with with 1,500 years and 40 authors, you would assume that somewhere something would be off. But the fact is, it's not. It's entirely consistent in its message. The third reason why one should believe the Bible is its accuracy. Its accuracy. The Bible should not be confused with a science textbook, but that does not mean that the Bible does not speak to issues that are scientific in nature. The water cycle that you learned in elementary was described in Scripture centuries before it was a scientific discovery. In some cases, science and the Bible have seemed to be at odds with each other. Yet when science has advanced enough, the scientific theories have proved wrong and the Bible has proved right. For example, it used to be a standard medical practice um, to bleed patients to cure illnesses. Many people died because of excessive blood loss. Now that we've advanced in our technology and scientific methods, we know that uh, bloodletting is not a cure and it's actually counterproductive against diseases. But the Bible has always taught that the life of a creature is in the blood, Leviticus 17.11. And so when it, every time science advances, the, you, you can't, the Bible is scientifically correct. The problem is scientists aren't smart enough to understand it. So the fourth reason the Bi- we should uh, believe the Bible is its truth claims concerning world history that have also been substantiated. Skeptics used to criticize the Bible for its mention of the Hittite people in Kings 7 and 7-6. Seven, The lack of any archaeological evidence to support the existence of a Hittite culture was often cited as a rebuttal against Scripture. But in 1876, archaeologists discovered 
evidence of the Hittite nation. And by the early 20th century, the vastness of the Hittite nation and its influence in the ancient world was common knowledge. Again, the Bible is correct. The fifth reason why we should believe the Bible is it contains fulfilled prophecies. Some of the the writers and authors of the Bible made claims about future events, uh, sometimes centuries in advance. If any one of those events that were predicted had actually occurred, it would be outstanding. But the truth is the Bible contains many, many prophecies that would be fulfilled. Some of the predictions were fulfilled in a short amount of time, like Abraham and Sarah having a son. Peter denied Jesus three times. Paul was a witness for Jesus in Rome. Other predictions were fulfilled hundreds of years later. There are 300 messianic prophecies fulfilled by Jesus from the Old Testament that could not have reasonably been fulfilled by one person unless some greater power was involved. Specific prophecies like Jesus' birthplace, activities, his manner of death, and resurrection demonstrate the pre-ternal, preternatural accuracy of Scripture, right? And so what's that saying? Is it saying, like, for example, the, the amount of time between the Old Testament and New Testament is 400 years. And so all the prophecies about Jesus in the Old Testament came way earlier than when Jesus actually showed up on the scene. And when he showed up on the scene— He fulfilled all the prophecies, right? And so we know that the Bible contains and has fulfilled the prophecies that it's given. When we put it to the test, the Bible is proved true in every area. And lastly, how do I study the Bible? I should have some of y'all come up and teach this. Um, How do I study the Bible? Scripture, observation, application, prayer, otherwise known as SOAP. Right? What this looks like is, number one, is Scripture. You're going to define or pick a section of Scripture in the Bible. It could be a couple verses. It could be a few verses. It could be a chapter. You're going to pick a section of Scripture, and you're going to read it. And if you want to take it another step, you can actually write it out to help you memorize it. Write it out a few times. Spend time reading the Scripture. Secondly, you're going to observe the text. You're going to observe the section of Scripture that you've picked out. When I say observe, it doesn't mean you're going to make application about it because that's later. Observe means you're going to ask yourself questions like who, what, when, where, how, why. You're going to ask yourselves these questions, and you're going to find answers to those questions, and you're going to seek to understand. Listen, this is important. You have to seek to understand the interpretation of the text. A lot of people don't know that observation has to have interpretation with it, meaning you have to understand who is this text written to, who is the original audience, who's the original author, what, what was this about, and take that into context before you get to your application. Because if you jump over observation and go straight to application, a lot of times we can take texts out of context, and it doesn't actually apply the way that we think it does. So scripture, observation, application. After you've done all your observation, you should spend at least, at least, if, say, say I'm going to carve out 10 minutes for my soap, which isn't very long, but maybe that's what you got. 10 minutes, okay? One minute, you're going to read it. Six to eight minutes, you're going to observe the text. Last couple minutes, you're going to make application, and then you're going to pray, right? Maybe it's an hour, okay? So the first two to five minutes, I'm going to read the text, and then for the next 45 minutes, I'm going to observe the text, right? This is where you're going to spend the most time, observation, because you have to get it right before you can jump to application. And then you're going to jump to application, and you're going to say, okay, now that I've observed the text, I know what it's about, I know who it's talking to, I know everything going on in this situation, now I can make an accurate application to what this means in my life. This is where you can practice some narcissism. You can put yourself into the story of whatever you're reading and say, what, how does this apply to me personally? That's where you can make the application. And then you're just going to end in prayer. And you're going to pray and talk to God and have communion with him. So how do I study the Bible? Soap. Scripture, observation, application, prayer. The Bible gives us the opportunity to see and know God. 
The scriptures reveal his character and nature, his sovereignty and power, and his reason for creating us, the universe, and everything in it. We read about God's dealings with humankind, his goodness and grace, his light and love, his holiness and justice, and his mercy and compassion. The Bible shows us truth. It exposes our rebellion, corrects our mistakes, trains us to live God's way. Through the word, we are put together and shaped up for the task that God has created for us. So do you want to become the best version of yourself that there could ever be? You've got to spend time in Scripture, believing its words and applying its truth. One of my biggest fears as a pastor is that somebody in here and myself will have wasted their life. The goal of life is not to just live and die. The goal of life is to make an impact, make an eternal impact, to be the best version of you so that you can be everything that God has desired and designed you to be, to fulfill the tasks that he has given you. And how you're going to do that is you've got to spend time in the scripture. You've got to understand what it's saying, how it applies to you, and put it into practice. James says not to just be hearers of the word, but to be doers as well. We have to live it out. We can't just spend all this time in our soap and then not have anything living out in our life. We've got to live it out. That's what I got for you guys uh, tonight, talking about the basics, talking about scripture. Um, Next week, I don't remember, I think it's worship we're going to talk about next week. Um, And uh, so, yeah, a few more weeks of this. Listen, these these things might seem uh, elementary to you, or they may seem over your head. Um, Either way, it's important stuff for you to know about the Christian life and why we believe and put into practice these things. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we come before you, and God, we thank you for your scriptures and how you've revealed yourself to us through your scripture. God, thank you for the 40 plus authors and the the years that it took to put this together and and how we can benefit from it. And God, I ask that we would um, look at this word as a lamp to our feet, that we would read it, we would spend time in it, that we would practice it. God, I ask that you would give us opportunities to um, dig deeper into it and to really get um, the best out of it. God, I pray these things in your name, Father. Amen.